Hello, thank you very much. I uh, would like to thank the Philosophy Sharing Foundation, uh, Nikki for chairing, and I would like to thank you all for braving the weather to come and uh, listen to me. So, um, basically as a general introduction, I would like to start off by explaining from where the interest in this topic uh, stems from. Uh, basically, the, the reason why I started researching and delving into philosophy of technology um, has two stories of origin in a certain sense. Uh, the first one goes back to my teenage years and still an interest of mine, which is science fiction in all its different media aspects. Um, I'm very, I'm very much interested in authors such as Philip K. Dick, William Gibson, um, filmography such as I don't know, The Matrix, Westworld, and so on and so forth. So that is one of those things that has always fascinated me in the context of technology and brought me closer also to philosophy in terms that I've always seen uh, science fiction as a thought experiment in a certain sense. Um, even philosophers themselves. If we think of Plato's cave or Nozick's experience machine, all right? So those are thought experiments that allow us to understand, to think. Science fiction does a similar thing as well, which is why then we have books such as The Philosophy of the Matrix, Philosophy of Dune, or The Philosophy of Black Mirror. However, what um, uh, then really piqued my interest in the topics of uh, technology and the politics of technology is my doctoral research that uh, Dr. Young has made reference to. In my research, this is about the uh, political, theological, and bio biopolitical dimensions of neoliberal thought, it is impossible to escape uh, the use of technology in the uh, proliferation and the implementation of current economic and political policies. Just to give you an example, um, we cannot discuss phenomena such as the gig economy if we do not appreciate the fact that the gig economy is only possible because of certain forms of technology. The gig economy can exist because of the ubiquitous use of, mobile, of smartphones. The gig economy can, can exist because we have access to mobile internet. And the gig economy can exist because we have the creation of apps such as uh, things, for example, like Uber, Bolt, and so on and so forth. And it, it is within this context, therefore, that we see this twinning um, between political concepts, economic concepts, and technological concepts. So we have conceptualizations such as uh, Nick Snirchek, who, who wrote about platform capitalism. And we also have Shoshana Zuboff, who spoke and wrote about surveillance capitalism. So in a certain sense, there is um, this immediacy of having to look at technology as a way of how political and economic concepts are developing. Even further, we are now seeing that we have an increasing, increasing forms of natural language programming or the widespread use of generative AI and how these will transform our social and political world. All of these raise a number of questions which, in my opinion, are of a political nature. So, politics and technology, how closely intertwined are there? First of all, we need to understand that, in a certain sense, technology is an instrument, all right? Technology creates instruments which are used by political administrations. Whereas it is, we always refer to literature, most writing was not about literature, but was about administration. It was about accounts, about census, and so on and so forth. So it was about political administration as well. However, there is something which is more intertwining between politics and technology. Um, first of all, we could argue that both politics and technology are part of the human condition. 
So we have Aristotle, who tells us that man is by nature a political animal. And then he also says that apart from being gregarious, man also has language and reason. Right? Language and reason being major tools in the creation of technology. Bernard Stigler argues that technology is part of the human condition because it attempts to solve human deficiencies. It is about an augmentation, improving our forms. It is part of our nature. In fact, Stigler, and this is something which will be a theme that goes across my talk, Stigler argues that technology is a pharmacon, right? For the Greeks, the term pharmacon simultaneously means both a poison and a medicine. So in a certain sense, so technology is both a poison and a medicine. Furthermore, if we think about it, Aristotle tells us that the aim of politics, the aim of politics is not just mere life, but to provide a good life. Similarly, the role of technology is also to help humans have a good life. So we can also argue that technology and politics have a similar purpose, which is the provision of a good life. We also have the notion over the years of homo faber. So in trying to define what makes us human, various authors have also defined humans as makers. Right? The idea of homo faber, which obviously also makes humans closer to their understanding of what a deity would be. However, we need to also understand that in discussing technology and therefore also the politics of technology or political philosophy of technology, there are a number of hurdles, which I will attempt to identify. The first hurdle being that when it comes to technology, many times we have some form of magical thinking or cargo cult belief in terms that people use technology, people live with technology. However, there is a certain lack of understanding how that technology works. People use search engines, people use social media. However, um, very few people understand the algorithms embedded within search engines or social media. So, in a certain sense, all right, there is um, uh, this idea of using it but not understanding it. Now, why am I mentioning magical thinking and cargo cults? I'm mentioning them because what happens when there's that lack of understanding is that sometimes you have the situation that people can associate forms of causality which do not really exist. So you can have certain forms of causality which are being associated to technology, but that is not actually the case, right? So um, uh, the idea, for example, that uh, social media might have a certain role all right, in, in certain aspects, for example, that, for example, social media is the primary cause why uh, people are not focusing and paying attention or reading as much as they did. Is it, all right, actually the case? Are there studies that show it, all right? So sometimes there is this kind of magical thinking. Then, by cargo cults, it's about the idea of an externality, all right? Some, an external force that brings with it um, certain goods, all right? Um, and normally these goods are certain changes. So again, cargo, the idea of Cargo cult is um, it's an anthropological term that refers to certain Melanesian uh, tribal cults um, where they used to experience aeroplanes passing and parachuting cargo and uh, they never 
there wasn't a certain understanding. So they started seeing these planes as some forms of deity, of an external deity, right? This is similar as well. So there's this idea of technology and cargo cult in terms of, oh, yeah, yes, I can use this, this will solve things. How does it work? I don't know. It solves my problems, all right? And what happens is that many times this kind of reasoning, this kind of reasoning um, becomes perpetrated in many ways, all right? So there's this idea that how does it work? The way it works is mysterious. People don't understand how it works. And people just say, yes, all right, it works, it functions, it serves its purpose. However, the problem with this kind of thinking is that you cannot really see any possible um, issues that might arise, any possible impl implications, and so on and so forth. Also, it is one of the reasons why you don't understand how it works. This is one of the reasons why, for example, we have the rise, um, uh, the proliferation, for example, of conspiracy theories. Again, because you create false causations. However, the issue is that what happens is that this kind of magical thinking, all right, this kind of cargo cult belief, becomes also part of the discourse of the authorities. And by authorities here, I'm referring to, for example, politicians or philosophers as well. All right? Um, why? Because you have the situation, all right, which, quoting Colton, tells us in the case of AI, quote, politicians and philosophers need to, be take, to, need to take an extreme and short-term view of AI, of AI in, order it, in order for it to appear relevant and timely, close quote. So this idea that, you know, um, come up with something, you know, uh, very catchy, something really big, so that you can get attention, all right? It's a bit of a clickbait mentality, all right? And unfortunately, this can be found both when it comes to policymakers, all right, and also at times people who should be a bit more cautious and a bit more critical. This leads us to situations where you have authors automatically declaring that technology or certain technologies will lead to a utopia or a dystopia, all right? These kind of extreme versions. So when we look at policies, for example, when we look at policies, we have these kind of declarations, for example, Malta Destination Blockchain Island, all right? And if we look at what the plan for is saying, it's uh, Malta is fast establishing a reputation as a hub for digital innovation and is preparing its finance sector for an AI-powered and data-driven future. AI and the Internet of Things technologies are next on the country's agenda. Wow. I mean, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot. Um, but the, the thing is this, that in this kind of proclamation, there is a form of how can I put it, this kind of um, cargo cult belief because it's sort of, yes, you know, now there is this, there's this technology, um, there's no mention of, for example, that you need to have uh, servers, that you need to have this, uh, you know, that's all put aside, this will be the solution, all right? Now, I'm not saying that the people who came up with these policies don't know about it, but when you're selling it to the public, when you're selling it to the electorate, it is not sold in, in terms of an explanation, but it's sold in terms of some utopic promise. Similarly, all right, many times when people discuss technology, all right, we have either promise of utopia, all right, that everything will be great, everything will be fantastic, we'll be living this uh, great, you know, peaceful uh, life altogether, or else some kind of dystopia. Um, here I tried my hand at using Midjourney, all right, so an AI program, generative AI program, to see what it understands as a form of dystopia. And as you can see, it's pretty much, um, you know, skyscrapers, reputed rivers, so no nature at all, no nature at all. Um, so 
it seems that even the AI has a certain way of looking at it. All right? So these are extremes. These are extremes. However, if we really want to discuss the po political understanding of, of uh, technology, we need to be careful. Why? Because these kind of extremes are what we could consider a form of technological determinism. Right? So the understanding of a utopian or dystopian vision of, of technology all right, can be deemed as a form of technology determinism whereby we're talking about technology, all right, technology as something almost metaphysical. So it's what um, either refers to as a technology with a capital T. All right? So sometimes, so on one hand, we have this problem of magical thinking in terms that we don't understand how technologies work. On the other hand, we also have this issue that when discussing technology, especially philosophy of technology, philosophers tend to speak about technology as this abstract metaphysical concept which is separate, independent from its users and from the actual technologies themselves. So we have this entity, this metaphysical entity, which is being referred to as technology. And it is here, therefore, that uh, you know, we can offer a criticism to individuals such as, for example, Jacques Ellul or Herbert Marcuse, who, in their work, they provide a contrast of technology to nature, all right, and uh, without any actual reference to specific technologies. So, you know, there is this idea of technology. Technology is the opposite of nature. Nature is good, technology is bad. All right? And leading to the idea that, um, so Marcuse refers to a form of technocratic ideology, all right? Whereas we have a lul talking about a technological order. Okay, so there is this idea that technology is separate from humans, it is determined, it is autonomous, and it will create this kind of matrix style of dystopia where technological artifacts, machines, will control human beings. All right? And in a certain sense, that is also a form of magical thinking. All right? It is what Winner would describe as, quote, a naive, naive technological determinism, close quote. So, what I propose is that we need to attempt to try to find some kind of political philosophy of technology which is more nuanced, which is more um, embedded in what is happening around us, which is less possibly abstract, all right, and more um, as some authors would refer to empirical in terms because it makes reference to actual technologies. So, first of all, what do we understand by technology? If we are to propose a political theory of technology, what do we understand by technology? So, first of all, by technology here, we are not understanding this metaphysical abstract concept. What we're looking at is something which, first of all, has a concrete material artifact associated to it. Secondly, by technology, we are understanding that we have something which is used, something which is used in practice, all right? A form of praxis. Third, that we have by technology, we are understanding that we have something which is not outside of the realm of humans, but humans are part of the process of how it is used, how it is designed, how it is made, and how it is modified. All right? So here we can see that there is a close interrelationship between humans and technology and artifacts. All right? Furthermore, Something else, another characteristic that we identify is that technology amplifies 
the impact, right? It amplifies and magnifies the impact that humans have on their environment, be it immediate, all right, and through technology, even their non-immediate environment. So just give you a case, plastic, all right? Plastic is something which um, you use, discard, whatever, it has an impact which is magnified, which goes beyond our immediate environment. So, technologies, all right, in other words, is a non-neutral transformative power, all right, technologies enhance the non-neutral transformative power that humans have. So, here we can see that there is an essential link between humans and technology, the idea of home of power. And from this, therefore, I conclude that technology is therefore a political issue. So, the question is, all right, we're saying that technology is a political issue, but are, and we're also saying that by technology, we are relating to material items. Now, the question is, are these material items political? Are technological artifacts political? All right, this is, as Winner tell us, tells us, all right, one of the most provocative and controversial aspects that we have. Can we give political qualities to technological artifacts? All right, people will argue many times that technology is neutral and then it all depends on how it is used. However, however, Technologies, all right, we have established that technologies are created by humans. We have established that technologies are designed by humans. Therefore, if they are created and designed by humans, therefore, they cannot be non-neutral because the people who design them are not neutral, right? That design in itself has within it certain values. The designer has chosen certain values over others, which makes that artifact all right, have certain values on it. So even if I choose between using a sustainable versus a non-sustainable material, that all is also a choice. That is a non-neutral choice. Furthermore, from a political perspective, we have Mumford who argues that in his essay, Authoritarian Democratic Techniques, that, quote, two technologies have recurrently existed side by side, one authoritarian, the other democratic. The first system-centered, immensely powerful, but inherently unstable. The other man-centered, relatively weak, but resourceful and durable." Close quote. So here what we can see is that for authors like Mumford, the way that a technology is designed can also show whether it is all right, designed for authoritarian purposes or for democratic purposes. Right? And here it is important that we need to look at individual technologies. We cannot just come up with something which is um, a blanket, blanket statements. So, for example, if we talk about the, the internet, all right, and democracy. A lot of people speak about the internet, for example, of being a non-democratic um, instrument, that it creates certain uh, forces and so on and so forth. However, the internet has also led to, for example, uh, groups like uh, the M25, all right, creating um, um, a system of voting which is not impeded by territoriality or borders. So, again, how one uses technology is either for authoritarian or for democratic techniques. So, technology is political, technologies are political because they have political impacts, they have social impacts. And uh, Winner tells us that there are two ways how we can understand the political dimension of technological artifacts. The first one being that technologies can produce new technical arrangements and social orders. 
For example, if we are looking at things like AI, all right, or new technologies, whatever, this in itself will create new arrangements, new social orders. Why? Because you need people who are trained, all right? So when you have this decision that you're going to, that to have an industry based on AI and things like that, you need people who are trained, which means that then your educational policy has to be reformed so that you have people who are trained for that kind of of um, that kind of industry, that kind of technology. So here it's not the technology, because the technology itself it is shaping society. All right, it's not that kind of determination, but the choice of using that technology has certain impacts which one has to take into consideration, or else you cannot use it. All right, which is why we made those, we identified those characteristics. However, there are. Um, However, there are technologies which are inherently political technologies, right? Such as when we create systems, all right, of control and surveillance, okay? Like when there was the proposal to have the project of Safe City Malta, all right? Which was uh, the idea of installing um, uh, cameras, surveillance cameras, which have, have facial recognition, all right? therefore having biometric uh, capabilities, all right? That is a form of surveillance. That is a political technology. It is inherently political, all right? Because it is being used for political process. Similarly, all right, we can call things like a vaccination drive also being a poli an inherently political technology in terms that you are using a technology, all right, to protect to vaccinate, to protect the population. That is also a political choice, all right? So there are two ways how technology functions in terms of politics. And the, the thing that we need to see, all right, the thing that, we need, that I'm going to try to show as well is that nothing can be seen in isolation. So with technological determinism, all right, there is this techno technology which is like an external aspect to humans which suddenly is above everything else. Now, what I'm arguing here is no, we cannot discuss technology in that kind of context. However, we cannot say that technology is neutral, all right, that it's got nothing. No, technology is part of a puzzle, all right? Part of a puzzle which influences society, all right? And the things that influence society, therefore, have things like technology, the economy, politics, belief systems, all right? All of these together shape society, and they shape each other. So the kind of technology that we're going to have will influence the kind of the economy that we can have. The kind of economy that exists will influence the kind of technology that we can have, and so on and so forth, all right? So we cannot remove by looking at technology as this kind of metaphysical concept, we are actually eliminating the influence of things such as the political system or the economic system. So there is a mutual influence over here and together they shape society. So understanding a technology Right? Understanding a technology allows, allows ways of shaping all right, the economy or shaping a political system or shaping society itself. For example, the, uh, Martin Luther was effective in his um, uh, reformation because he understood the power of the printing press and the printed word. Okay? However, it's not just that, right? It's, it's obviously a con all put together. <laughs> However, I also propose something else. I also propose that the technology is political because technology offers new forms of political discourse. Right? 
So here I am looking at the work of Donna Haraway, all right, and sort of extrapolating a bit from it. So what we have is that science and technology offer us ways of understanding the world. Science and technology offer us ways of understanding the human. Because science and technology offer us these categories, these categories then are adopted, taken over by political ideologies. So we have this kind of influence. So as Don Haraway argues, techno-scientific discourse is not objective. All right? Techno-scientific discourse, such as, for example, things like uh, genetics, mechanical view of the world, all right, reflect political, social and political paradigms. Similarly, political paradigms are also influenced by the dominant techno-scientific discourse. So, um, case in point, if we have a biological model of society, if we look, take a biological model of society, then we have the development of a socio-biological politics. All right? If we have a genetic, gen if we obsess, all right, we understand humans as being genetic makeup only, sort of these creatures, all right, which are DNA, then you can create a political ideology which is based on this kind of genetic eugenic understanding. Now, however, all right, this also applies to technological understandings. So when machines were being widespread, all right, when machines came into full view, suddenly we had a machinic understanding of the human. So the human body as a machine. How can I use human bodies as a ma machine? All right? How can it become part of the machine? All right? then we have the famous uh, silent movie of Charlie Chaplin, Modern Man, okay? where he literally becomes part of the machine. All right? That is what Taylorism is. The human becomes part of the machine, a cog in the machine. Similarly, nowadays, the dominant discourse is not a machinic discourse, but a computational discourse. So nowadays, we have an understanding of humans as being programmable individuals, of society being programmable, right? So what technology does, what technology does is that technology offers a discourse, a narrative, which political ideology then can take up for its own uses and needs. And as a case study, as a case study for this, all right? I wanted to look, therefore, at the concept of cybernetics, at cybernetic technology. Now here, people who are uh, from the computer science field and so on, I might be treading a bit dangerous grounds here in my definition of cybernetics. However, please bear with me. <laughs> um, basically, as I said, so we need to move away from the idea of technology as a abstract concept. If we want to discuss uh, an actual political theory of technology, we need to look at actual technologies. Now here, what, by looking at cybernetics, what I'm referring to is the idea of control systems. All right? So by cybernetic technology, I am understanding, uh, I'm understanding it as an information processing and transmitting tools that add to the intelligence, all right, of course, controlling it. So it's close to the concept of not nowadays, it's considered as big data, all right? That's what's being understood as cybernetics. So first of all, cybernetics stems from the Greek word kybernetes, which means steersman, steersman or pilot. So it's there about guiding, it's about steering, all right? And this is the result of Wiener, Robert Wiener's book, Cybernetics, Control and Communication in the Animal and the Machine. All right, so for Robert Wiener, all right, um, you have this idea of a cybernetic loop, all right, where you have the sensor, the controller, then you have the feedback, and then you adapt according to the feedback that you get. So the control system, the control system, all right, is about 
self-regulation, adaptation, what Wiener refers to as homeostasis. So for Wiener, it is this idea of adapting, all right, self-adaptation, which is the key of a cybernetic system. All right? Now, cybernetics as a concept, all right, cybernetics as a concept has influenced a number of authors. For example, um, Frederick August Hayek, all right, in developing his idea of the free market, all right, the free market as a spontaneous order, when encountering this idea of cybernetics, he started referring to the free market as a form of cybernetic system. So you have the free market, all right, you have feedback through the market systems like uh, price mechanisms, supply and demand, and so on, so, and you adapt to that kind of information. All right? However, you also have technologists, all right, who come up, who take up this idea. So we have the case of Stafford Beer, who, in his uh, paper, which he calls the Liberty Machine, all right, he argues that, quote, the responsibility of cybernetics is not only to awaken society to environmental and social threats, but also to provide the tools with which to solve them." Close quote. So here we can see that the notion, this technological concept of cybernetics, all right, is being implemented, is being applied to society as a whole, to politics, all right? So it's about, we need to create a system, all right, that offers solutions. And the reason why I picked cybernetics, in fact, is because there was a project which attempted to put this kind of model into practice, which was, all right, uh, done in Allende's Chile. All right, this was Project Cybersyn, okay? So during um, Allende's uh, premiership in Chile, all right, a short term, uh, short um, because of the coup, um, uh, premiership, all right? There was this idea of creating a cybernetic system, a cybernetic system which would embody, all right, Chilean socialist principles, all right, and offer the possibility of controlling the industry, industrial complex of controlling the economy, all right? So basically, um, Beer from the UK was invited to Chile, and over there they proposed this project, which they call this Project Cybersyn, which is um, an amalgamation of the words cybernetics and synergy. And basically, the idea would be that you have this. This was a room which was actually built, all right, a proof of concept, whereby basically. Um, you would have a room which would receive messages, feedback from the uh, machines, all right, which were Im implanted in the different factories. So basically the idea was, all right, of integrating or of creating like a cloud format, all right, where you have a main computer which is receiving, all right, the information, the information from the various telex machines which were installed in the state-run factories, okay? So the whole idea was that this room is a control room, all right? Depending on the information that you are receiving, then you decide to enact, all right? The idea, so why is it a socialist idea? Because the idea was that the information was bottom up, all right? Not top down, but bottom up. So basically, you're getting information from the um, machine operators, technicians, and so on and so forth. All right? Furthermore, it wasn't just about the industrial complex. So one of the ideas, all right, which is also found in Beer's uh, concept of the Liberty Machine, is also the idea of, for example, engaging, receiving feedback on the happiness of the people. All right? And depending on the happiness of the people, then you decide to adapt the system based on what they are needed, all right? In practical terms, in practical terms, the notion of the control room was that if, for example, a factory needed certain resources, 
you would know beforehand that they need those resources so that you can plan ahead. Keep in mind that, you know, here the idea was that in Allende, Chile, uh, Allende had nationalized most um, industries and the idea was that everything was being controlled by the state, all right? So control, central control was important, all right? However, there was also the idea of a form of democratization. Now, cyber sin did not happen, okay? Cyber sin did not happen um, when it, it worked. There were teething problems, let's put it this way. However, we all know what happened in 1973 and everything was destroyed. However, this notion of using technology as a political tool, all right, as an administrative tool, exists, all right? And we have flowers who tells us that if you want to see a cybernetic system, all right, you need to look at a city, all right? A good city, all right, a good city is well-managed, focused, and data-driven, all right? Basically, if we think about it, all right, let's think about it. Water, our supply of water, reverse osmosis, all right, goes into the system. You have a whole feedback loop, all right? Problems arise when that feedback loop is broken. So what you have here is that we just open the tap, water comes out without realizing the technology that lays behind it, all right? What we were talking about before, of the magical thinking, all right? So if we want good city planning, good urban planning, all right? Policy makers need to think in a form, in a cybernetic form of understanding, all right? So it's about data analytics. But it's not just about analyzing the data in a cybernetic mode of thinking, all right? In a cybernetic po political thinking, what you have is that the, the analysis is also offering you solutions and importantly, that you can plan ahead, all right? That you can plan ahead. This is the idea. This is the notion that one looks at. So a cybernetic control system, a cybernetic control system is about um, how to offer a good life. All right? So we looked at cyber sin which was about democratic values, socialist values, helping the people. We looked at the way urban planning happens, which is about the people, which is about... However, that is not the whole story. Because I can also have cybernetic thinking or cybernetic tools or cybernetic technologies which can be used for more nefarious reasons. So in this kind of, so in this kind of technologies, we can also have create complex panopticons, right? Complex control systems, which are about surveillance, all right? Collection of private data, all right? Um, reprisals and so on and so forth. This too can be a form of cybernetic thinking. So what we can see here is that we can have these technologies, this technological form of thinking, all right? One is for the people, the other is against the people. One is democratic, the other one is authoritarian. Similarly, another political question that we need to ask ourselves is the question of ownership. Who should own this kind of technologies. Should the kind, these kind of technologies only be uh, under control of private entities? Let's keep in mind, so when we're talking about big data, all right, many times we talk about the state, but in reality, when it comes to big data or data brokers, these most of the times are private institutions. What's also interesting 
is a question of political control. So when we have individuals like Elon Musk, all right, who have at their disposal technologies such as Starlink, all right, what we have is an individual who is servicing the US government and even others. All right? Now the question is therefore, who is in control there, the US government or Elon Musk? All right? So that too is a political question. It's a question of authority. Right? So in many ways, all right, what I am proposing here is that we need to offer a political, theoretical understanding of technology, but not technology as this meta-narrative, as this meta-concept, but in the context of types of technologies, forms of technologies. We cannot talk of technology in this big way. And it is, and technology, all forms of technologies, in some way or another, are going to be political more than we actually think. So, to conclude, all right, why did I look into cybernetic systems? I looked into cybernetic systems because it fulfills those kind of criteria that we were looking at. That cybernetic systems change the environment um, uh, around them, all right? Humans use cybernetic to change the environment. Cybernetic systems are inherently political because they are used, they can be used as a means of controlling and or creating a new order of society based on the ideology of the users. Furthermore, cybernetics also offers, also creates a kind of discourse, a technological discourse, which can be taken over, which can be adopted as a, um, as a form of political discourse in itself, all right? So it is very easy to think of cybernetic discourse as being rechanged as a form of political discourse. So what we need to look at is that ultimately, when discussing technology and the impact of technology, we need to treat it, we need to treat Scientific, sci, uh, techno scientific discourse, not only within those parameters, but also as a political discourse. Thank you.